Welcome everybody to lecture seven. Uh, so the topic of today's lecture is Buchberger's algorithm, which is a method for producing Grobner bases. I'll remind you what a Grobner basis is in a moment, uh, but as I did last time I spoke here, I'd like to just uh, explain somehow one of the things that this will be used for, so to step back into the, the geometry before we uh, charge ahead with leading terms and, and so on. So let's suppose we're given algebraic varieties, affine varieties rather. V and W. And suppose we know the equations that or a generating set for those ideals. And let me just suppose, for simplicity, I can reformulate this so that this isn't involved, but it just makes the presentation a little less uh, charming. Let's suppose for the moment that um, the ideal of the intersection, so we've discussed before that the intersection of affine varieties is an affine variety. Uh, and let's suppose the ideal of that thing is i plus j. It's certainly true that the vanishing set of i plus j, which is just the set of points that satisfy all the f equations and all the g equations, so that's clearly the intersection. Uh, so v of i plus j is clearly v intersect w. Uh, as we know, it doesn't necessarily follow that i of v intersect w is i plus j. Let me just assume that. Well, here's a basic question you might ask. So two weeks ago I talked about uh, you know, whether one variety is contained in another, that's a basic kind of relation between varieties. And another basic kind of relation is to ask, do these two given varieties intersect? So you could imagine a circle at the origin of some radius and a line uh, of some radius, or a sphere and a plane, or, you know, a generic pair of varieties. Do they meet? And that question is whether the intersection is empty. But we know that's equivalent to, to this. Uh, if you forgot why that is, remember we've discussed several times that V is contained in W if and only if IW is contained in IV. And so if you uh, do that inclusion in both directions, you get, you get the statement I just made. OK, so the intersection is empty if and only if those ideals are the same. Uh, but that's if and only if i plus j is equal to the whole ring. So the whole ring is an ideal, and that's the ideal of the empty set, if you think about it. Right? Those polynomial functions which vanish on the empty set, well, what does it mean to vanish on the empty set? There's a quantifier for all x in the empty set, the function vanishes. But that's vacuously true because there's nothing in the empty set. So every function vanishes on the empty set, so to speak. Well, that's true if and only if 1 is in i plus j. As soon as you have 1, then if you're an ideal, you contain everything. OK, so that reduces to a check of whether a given polynomial, namely 1, belongs to our ideal. So all we have to do is check whether 1 is in the ideal. So I give you a bunch of explicit polynomials, and then I ask, can you get 1 by combining linear combinations of those polynomials where the coefficients are other polynomials? Uh, how would you go about doing that? Well, you can try Let's division. Let's try dividing. Yeah, yeah. that's right. <laughs> So we can try division, but it's, uh, it's not going to work. So let's see. So we could divide 1 by the f's and the g's. OK, so we do that. Then we get a remainder. Now, if the remainder is 0, well, then we've 
by the algorithm written one as a linear combination of f's and g's, so we know this is true. However, uh, as we've discussed, if r is not zero, then it is not necessarily the case that one is not in the ideal. Right, it's not if and only if. The remainder being zero of course means it's in the ideal, but the remainder being non-zero, well that particular expression doesn't look like it says one is not in the ideal, but you can't rule out the possibility there's some other way of writing one as a linear combination of the generators that just isn't produced by the division algorithm. Okay, this is terrible. That means division is just not, as it stands, good enough to solve this problem. And in some sense, we don't actually have a solution to that problem. Uh, okay, so the trick is to improve division. And the way to improve division is to not to attempt to divide by arbitrary systems of polynomials, in this case, the f's and the g's, but to only do divisions by certain special generating sets, and those are the Grobner bases. So let me remind you. Hey, just a quick question. Yeah. Um, I don't know, it might be a silly question. I'm, I can't really visualize dividing one by the F's and G's. Um, like the first step of that, aren't you looking like you're, you're trying to uh, like you divide by the leading term of one of the f's or g's like doesn't it just instantly not work unless uh the f's or g's are like a constant yeah that's right okay so then like i don't know because then you then you consider the scenario what if r is not zero and i was like what is it <laughs> it's like a very small set of scenario yeah um, good so this is this is meant to illustrate the worst possible case of attempting to do this, right? So okay. it might right. seem more plausible if I, uh, if I was checking some other generator was in I plus J. Um, so generically, you'd have to ask this question, is the remainder zero or non-zero? Uh, but you can see in this example that, yeah, as you say, it's not, um, okay. it's clearly cool. not going to be useful. Yeah. Okay, so a Grobner basis is a generating set for an ideal that satisfies a condition on the leading terms. We've seen this before, this is a reminder. So let this have some monomial order. I'll often not say this, right, sort of presumed. Whenever I talk about leading terms or Grobner bases, it's always with respect to some monomial order, and it's usually just fixed in, in the background. So let G be a set. Of non-zero polynomials. Non-zero because I want to talk about their leading terms. It's not a real restriction, right? Then G is a Grobner basis for an ideal I if if you take the ideal generated by the leading terms it's equal to the ideal generated by all the leading terms of all the polynomials in I. So this inclusion is clear because the, well, uh, <laughs> no, as I said it, it's not clear because it's not, I didn't say that the GIs are in I. So let's say if G is in I and that's a typo. Okay, so if the g's are in I, then their leading terms are in this ideal, so that inclusion from left to right is clear, uh, but from right to left is a real condition. It's not immediate, I suppose, from 
from the definition that such a G actually is a generating set for I. Uh, that's true as a, as a lemma, uh, or you could just adopt it as part of the definition of a Grobner basis. So you would say G, a generating set for I, is a Grobner basis if this condition holds. Um, either way is up. It's equivalent. It's up to you. It's not meant to, like, what, what the hell is this supposed to mean? Why is this a kind of reasonable and natural condition? Uh, if you sort of really internalized some of the proofs that we did last time, you could kind of see why this is natural. By the end of today, I hope it seems like a very natural condition. But in any case, we're going to rephrase it as an equivalent condition on the result of Euclidean division of a polynomial by this generating set. And that hopefully seems very natural. So yeah, just hang in there in terms of interpreting this, this definition. So recall from last lecture that um, Ken proved that every ideal has a Grobner basis. This was sort of proved along the way to proving the Hilbert basis theorem. Right? We produced a finite basis for any ideal uh, in a polynomial ring, and the one we produced actually has this condition, sort of like, by the way, uh, we produced not only a finite generating set, but a Grobner basis. All right. Uh, so how do we get our hands on such things? Uh, well, that's a question I'll address in a moment. So uh, first I want to talk about the result of dividing by uh, a Grobner basis. Is this theorem uh, for, for any monomial order, every ideal has a Grobner basis with respect to that order? Yeah, that's right. Okay. Yeah, and for different orders, the the bases will be different. Yeah. So let's take some ideal. With a Grobner basis. So we've discussed many defects of the Euclidean division algorithm in multiple variables. It may depend on the order of the sequence of polynomials you divide by. If you get a remainder and it's non-zero, that doesn't mean much in terms of whether or not the element belongs to the ideal. Uh, so it, it's just kind of a bit broken, right? The remainder is not unique. That's another way of saying what I just said. Right? Given a polynomial, there's a unique R in R satisfying the following two conditions. First of all, no term of R is divisible by any of the leading terms of the generators. Uh, is R K join X1 to XN? Oh, thank you, yeah. I also have a dumb question from the previous, from actually both boards. It's intentional that N is both the number of variables and the number of basis elements. Oh, thank I you. don't know if we proved that. No, it is not intentional and not reasonable um, very oh, often. Oh, yeah, that's, that's why I was, yeah. Yeah, thank you. Um, no, that's, that's oh, it's M on the previous board, or did you just put that in? I just changed it, yeah. <laughs> OK. <laughs> so that's three typos. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Sorry. I don't think they can. Okay, I'm glad I was right. I'm glad I, put, I I'm glad I had this correct. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Thank you. Uh, right. No term of R is divisible by any of the GI. Now that that's the sort of uh, 
analog in multiple variables of the condition in the univariate division algorithm, which says the degree of the remainder is less than the degree of the divisor. Right? In, in one variable, it's literally the same condition if there's a single GI. Right? And secondly, there is a G in I such that F is equal to G plus R. Well, that R, since it's unique, we can give it a name and call it the remainder. Right? We couldn't use the word the really before. Uh, well, we could. I mean, the algorithm produces a remainder, but it's kind of got this wishy-washy status of depends on the order and, and so on. Okay, so now we have a very strong notion of remainder, just as good as we do in the one variable case. And note that the, the remainder R does not depend on the order. G is just a set here. I'm not saying R is the result of the division algorithm, although in particular you could compute it that way since it's unique. It's unique satisfying those two properties that make no reference to the order or the division algorithm a priori. Okay, so this says that division in general in multiple variables is broken, but for Grobner bases it's exactly as good as in the one variable case. Okay, so the existence of a remainder satisfying one and two follows from the division algorithm. For that, we're comfortable with, because if I do division by the GIs, I'll get some expression that looks like this. Where this is what I'm going to call G, it's certainly in the ideal, and the division algorithm produces an R uh, no term of which blah 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 is divisible by any of the leading terms of the GI. That was one of the things we proved the division algorithm achieves. So the existence of R satisfying those two conditions is something we already know. It's uniqueness that requires something. And now you see where this condition on the Grobner basis uh, somehow acquires a, a clear meaning. Okay, suppose we had two. That is, suppose we had two polynomials, R and R prime, satisfying those two conditions, I and I, I. Well, that would mean that we could write F as G plus R, that's the first expression, and G prime plus R prime, R prime being the second, and they both satisfy one and two. So remember how you prove the remainder is unique in the one variable case. You say, suppose there were two expressions like this, and then you argue, you look at R minus R prime, and you see that it both has to have degree less than G, but also is a multiple of G. Okay, sort of too many G's floating around, but uh, hopefully that made some sense to you. So we just do the same thing in the multivariable case. So consider well, R, which is F minus G, and F is G prime, G prime plus R prime. Okay, so just rearranging, I get R minus R prime is equal to G prime minus G, and that's in I. So in the one variable case, I is generated by a single polynomial, and this is of degree less than the degree of G. Well, if it's non-zero. So the argument in one variable looks like this. If the difference between these two remainders were non-zero, it would both have degree less than the degree of G, but also be divisible by G, 
and that's a contradiction. So that's what we say in the one variable case. In the multivariable case, I say if r minus r prime is non-zero, then it has a leading term. But that leading term is the same as the leading term of g prime minus g, and that's an element of i. So that's in the ideal generated by the leading terms of i. But by the condition that g is a Grobner basis, this is just all the things divisible by one of the leading terms. So this is what being a Grobner basis says. OK, so hence some, so remember with monomial ideals, this is a monomial, these are monomials. If you're in a monomial ideal, you're divisible by one of the generators. So hence some LTGI divides the leading term of r minus r prime. But if you think about it, r minus r prime, look at the monomials in r and r prime, that leading term is, is one of those monomials that comes from either r or r prime, right? So that leading term is proportional. Maybe the constants get messed up when you subtract. But it's proportional to a term in either r, r, or r prime. But that's a contradiction, because no term of either r or r prime, by condition i, none of those terms are divisible by any of the LTGIs. So this is a contradiction. That contradiction proves that, well, uh, what's the contradiction? The contradiction proves that r minus r prime must be 0, which is the uniqueness we want. OK, so this is really quite clever. Yeah, so general, general, <laughs> that's halfway between generic and general. Uh, generic division isn't well behaved, but division by a Grobner basis is exactly as good as in the one variable case. Quite remarkable. So it's now easy to prove the following. So let G be a Grobner basis. Uh, for I. And let F be a polynomial. Then F is in I. I'll just reuse the notation from the lemma. So R is the, that unique remainder, which, by what I said, is the remainder from the division algorithm. Right? The unique R in the proposition is, in particular, what you get from the division algorithm in any order, right? using any order on G. So F is in I if and only if that remainder is 0, the remainder upon division by G. Why is that? Well, uh, if you look at the previous board, if you do the division algorithm and you get a remainder which is 0, then f is equal to that first segment, which is in i. So that direction is clear. If f is in i, Well, then I can write f is f plus 0. Done. <laughs> Why? Well, OK. Uh, let's go back to the, f the first board here. I, I claim that taking r to be 0 works. No term of 0 is divisible by any of the LTGIs. Yeah, there are no terms in 0. 
And the second condition, there is a G in I such that F is G plus R, well, that's F equals F plus zero. The point being that that expression of something of f as something in i plus something satisfying the first condition is unique. So if I get zero from this trivial expression, I must also get zero from the division algorithm, which is another way of producing that unique polynomial remainder. Okay. So this gives you a an algorithm for checking whether a given polynomial is in a given ideal, if you already know a Grobner basis, then you can just do division. Okay, so this reduces the problem of checking whether two varieties are contained in one another, or whether their intersection is empty, and many other related geometric questions. It reduces them, them to the problem of finding a Grobner basis. If you can find this basis, your home, you just have to do divisions to answer all those questions. Uh, so that's what we now turn to. Uh, but I'll pause here for some discussion and questions. Anything about this I can clarify? Uh, so obviously the uniqueness is, is important, right? Mm -hmm. So I, OK, I, I'm, I'm struggling somehow to see how this gives us exactly what we want and, and why the uniqueness enters the picture, if you could just briefly go over that again. Sure. Um, so you're referring to the proof of the corollary or just the broader? Yeah, the proof of the corollary. Yeah, sure. So uh, if we go back to the, the previous board. So as soon as I have any R, which satisfies these two conditions, then it is the remainder. So here's one way of producing an R satisfying those conditions. Take your generating set and do Euclidean division. That will always produce an R that satisfies those two conditions. If you have any other way of producing an R that satisfies those two conditions, it has to be equal to the remainder you get by division, by uniqueness. So one way of reading the proof we just gave is, is saying the following. Uh, so you could run through this proof. Maybe we should do it right now. Suppose you knew that F was in I to start with. OK, so let's read through the proof with that in mind. So suppose we know that this is in I. Then we don't need this second expression, right? I can just look at this formula and jump straight to R equals F minus G in I. So under the condition we already know F is in I, I get to this, and then I just replace everywhere. Sorry? Is having problems with Roblox freezing or something. Oh, okay. Oh, I see. Okay. Um, I'll continue with that when she gets back. Are there any other questions I can address in the interim? Um, I kind of echo Billy's view earlier. So, are we, well, maybe you're going to move on to it next soon anyway, but um, I, I don't see clearly how this resolves the you know trying to divide one by by these uh Grovener bases polynomials. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, so that's that's a good question. Uh what do you think might happen therefore if we try and compute a Grovener basis? Mm -hmm. What is the only I'm condition guessing... yeah go ahead. Yeah there might be some some kind of special situation we'd see between the Grobner bases of i and j or something, which makes the division algorithm become a lot more degenerate or something. Well, suppose... Get, like a constant term? Yeah, exactly. So, yeah. Yeah, right. So you'll see, I mean, if the intersection is empty, then one has to be in the ideal, and then, as you say, dividing by these polynomials into one is kind of trivial. So 
The only way that could produce a zero remainder is if in your Grobner basis you have something that's just a constant. So that's how you'll know if the intersection is empty. You'll be computing the Grobner basis, churn, 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 and at some point you're going to stick a constant in there, um, in, the, in the Buchberger algorithm, which we'll see in a moment. So that's, um, yeah, it's a good question, but that's how it, that, that's sort of seeming uh, strangeness is resolved. You'll actually have in any Grobner basis a constant. Wow. Okay. Look forward to seeing that soon. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Do uh, Eleanor? Can you hear me now? Maybe. Uh, we. Well, I can't hear you, Eleanor. So your speaker dropped for a second. Hmm. Oh, good. Okay. I'll just continue. Uh, maybe she can hear me. So <clears throat> um, if we run through this proof with f in i, then we'll get r in i, and we can just replace r minus r prime by r, and we'll end up arguing that r is in fact zero. Right? Um, so as soon as, uh, as soon as you know that f is in i, uh, this exact proof will end up showing the remainder is zero. So that's a way of arguing this corollary without invoking the uniqueness directly. I hope that helped. OK, let's proceed over to the next set of boards. Okay, now that this thing is unique, uh, I'm going to give it a name. We'll define it in general, not only for Grobner bases, but... Um, oh, I promised to, promised to pronounce this correctly, didn't I? Uh, a Grabner basis. Just kidding. I, I know Eleanor is unable to speak. So. Thanks. Um... <laughs> there she is. <laughs> okay. Um, okay, so... Given a sequence, we write f bar f for the remainder of lowercase f upon division by f. f is a sequence here, right? Round brackets. Uh, so you just run the division algorithm with that sequence and you get this remainder. Uh, if capital F happens to be a Grobner basis, then it's independent of the order. All right, so we now have uh, a discussion about how to construct Grobner bases. Now, it, it may just happen that a basis you find for an ideal is a Grobner basis, but how would you even know? Uh, you have to check this condition, right? You have to check that uh, the leading terms of your generators Well, what does that mean, really? It means if f is in i, the leading term of f is divisible. This is equivalent. Is, equi is divisible by some LTGI. It seems impossible to check that uh, directly. And maybe you get lucky and there's some way of arguing that, uh, but it's very far from clear that you can do that uh, in practice. And doing it directly without any more technology than that uh, is indeed kind of hopeless uh, for a general generating set. So if we're going to produce Grobner bases, uh, we need to first have a way of recognizing them. And that's what we're now going to do. Now this is going to be a little indirect, and it's genuinely a deep idea. So uh, I'll try and explain as best I can, but this is not, um, not meant to be obvious how this proceeds. 
I'm going to say something cryptic first, uh, which hopefully makes some sense by the end of today. The idea behind the Buchberger algorithm is to examine the reason or reasons behind polynomial equations or equations between polynomials, maybe it's better. by reason is, is what a geometer calls a syzygy, which is kind of the sexiest word in mathematics for sure. Uh, this comes from um, astronomy, a very cool history of this word. Okay, uh, some definitions. Given two monomials, x to the alpha and x to the beta. We define the least common multiple to be, well, kind of the obvious thing. Just look through all the exponents and take the maximum. So example, uh, the least common multiple of x squared y and x, y, z is, well, I take the biggest power of x, that's 2. I take the biggest power of y, that's 1. I take the biggest power of z, that's 1. Okay. Now here's the cryptic bit. So out of nowhere there's going to come the s polynomial. s is for syzygy. The reason for this polynomial will, will be apparent in the lemma that follows. Uh, it's not meant to be clear that you would think of this. Uh, I guess I can see how, if you're very familiar with how the division algorithm works, uh, this idea might occur to you, but this is historically like a genuinely new idea. So. the s polynomial of f and g. So let f and g be given, they're non-zero, take their leading monomials and take the least common multiple. And the s polynomial is the following expression. It depends on the order. So take x gamma and divide it by the leading monomial of f. That's some monomial, sorry, leading term. Now the leading term here is some coefficient d times x to the alpha. And x to the gamma, you can divide it by x to the alpha, that just means take x to the gamma minus alpha. Right? So that's just 1 on d, x to the gamma minus alpha. I hope it, that's, um, it's not like I'm proposing a general division operation for polynomials, right? This is a very special polynomial. It's a, a constant in the field, which every non-zero constant in the field is invertible, and it's uh, subtracting an exponent from a monomial. Times f minus the same thing for g. Okay. What on earth is this for? It's just some polynomial at the moment, right? Defined for any pair of non-zero monomials, and it depends on the monomial order, right? Because it's got this leading term in it. <laughs> yeah, it's a bit like wizardry. I'm not going to deny it. Okay. Hopefully the proof will make sense of this definition. I claim, or rather, uh, Buchberger claims, that any cancellation that occurs between polynomials when you add them up, 
is explained by S polynomials in the following sense. So let's suppose we have a sum. polynomials which all have the same multi-degree I mean, if this is kind of a generic situation in which there's a cancellation when you add up polynomials I might as well just pay attention to the place where the cancellation happens and assume that uh, they all have the same multi-degree Suppose there's a cancellation, which is to say that the multi-degree of the sum is less than delta. Right, so you have x squared plus y plus minus x squared plus z. That's p1, that's p2. They're of lower order in the monomial order, assume that. Uh, and so you have some cancellation, y plus z. So this result here has a leading term, which is either one of those, and it's less than the leading term of P1 and P2. Okay, so there's some cancellation between the leading terms. So suppose that happens. Then the original thing Is a k-linear combination, so a linear combination with coefficients in k of the following set. Take all the s polynomials sort of pairwise. It's kind of obvious, so I'll through it in a moment, uh, it's obvious these things have multi-degree less than delta. Maybe let's do it now. Have a look at this S polynomial. What are we doing in this thing? Well, we're setting up the leading terms to cancel. Right? It's kind of like the division algorithm. So what's the leading term of... So suppose... Suppose the leading term of f is dx to the alpha, and the leading term of g is ex to the beta. Then this is x to the alpha on d, uh, sorry, I said alpha, I think, gamma, divided by dx to the alpha, f minus this. So I get... I mean, the point is, yeah, maybe I should write it out slightly differently. Um, yeah, whoops. Let me write it out as leading term plus stuff, right? So f is the leading term plus subleading stuff. Minus x to the gamma divided by ex to the beta leading term of g plus stuff. Now when you multiply by a monomial, you change the, obviously, all the monomials in the expression, but they kind of shift all together, right? So the leading term of this here is this times the leading term here. So those just sort of cancel, right? So the leading term of the product on the left-hand side is going to be x to the gamma times 1. So it's x to the gamma minus, and same on the right-hand side, x to the gamma. So there will be a cancellation of the leading terms there. So you take an arbitrary pair of polynomials and you kind of shift them so that the leading terms cancel. OK, what does that show you? Well, it shows you that the leading term of s is less than gamma. right? OK, so we'll use that in a moment. OK, proof. So the proof of the criterion for recognizing uh, Grobner bases has kind of two parts. 
this is the easy part. Uh, this is really not so bad. It's maybe hard to come up with, but easy to check. So take the leading coefficient, di of pi, along the lines of what I just did. So by assumption, di x to the delta is the leading term of pi. OK. Uh, then since the multi-degree of the sum is less than delta, well, what does that mean? It means that all these leading terms had to cancel, right? So inside this sum, it looks like d1x to the delta plus lower order terms, that's p1, plus d2x to the delta plus lower order terms, plus so on. So the, the leading term of that will be d1 plus d2 plus dot 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 plus ds x to the delta plus lower order terms. For that sum to have multi-degree less than delta, this coefficient here has to be zero. I hope that's clear. Oh, it's really a pity this is going to have to be split over two sets of boards, but we'll make do. All right. Now note that since pi and pj have the same multi-degree, namely delta, gamma is also equal to delta. So this is x to the delta divided by di x to the delta pi. Similarly for j. And uh, as I was just explaining, it's true in general and it's true in this simple situation. Uh, the multi-degree of that, because we're going to cancel out the leading terms, x to the delta in this case, uh, it has multi-degree less than the least common multiple, which is just delta, x to the delta. Uh, so this, this s polynomial has multi-degree less than delta. Okay, so now let's note that the following So this is a k-linear combination of s polynomials. Let's compute it. So it's d1 times s p1 ps. So that's 1 over d1 p1. This will look like magic, but, but it is. <laughs> uh, this part's OK. I think the, the proof of the theorem is, is really kind of magic. Okay, so that's, that's what this sum looks like. Well, those are just going to cancel, right? And that with that, so I'm going to end up with p1 plus p2 plus dot 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 plus ps minus 1. And then all the terms that come from these uh, ps expressions, but that's going to be minus 1 on ds d1 ps, well, d1 plus dot dot dot, ds minus 1 ps. Okay. Well, what's this? How can I simplify that sum? Well, that is minus ds. Yeah, good. Because some of if I, if I add ds as well, it's zero. Thing. And look at that. That is the sum from one to s of the pi's. Da -dum. That's what I promised, right? I said I'd show you that the sum of the pi's was a k-linear combination of those s polynomials. In fact, I didn't need all of them, right? I, I got to choose one of them, ps. I could have chosen any. I could have chosen p1 rather than ps to be kind of the, the thing that doesn't change here. Uh, so it's I proved something a little bit stronger than the statement, I guess. 
Any questions? Could you just go back over um, Delta here is the multi degree of uh, all of the PIs? Like they all have the same multi degree. That's right, yeah. But um, in defining S here, the S is defined based on some least common multiple of the leading terms of uh, two polynomials. Could you go over why that's, why the gamma on this board is the delta on this board? Oh, sure, yep. Okay, so if I, so to compute this S polynomial, yeah, you're right. So the first step I'm going to do is I'm going to say, let x gamma be the least common multiple of the leading monomial of pi and the leading monomial of pj. But that's the least common multiple of x to the delta and x to the delta. Hang on, pi, pj, the multi-degree is it's the delta. Oh, right, so multi-degree is the, like, is the sum of the degrees of the components of the leading term. Uh, I don't know about sum. It, it is the the tuple which determines the monomial, oh, the, which is right, the yeah. leading monomial, yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah. Yeah, for a second, I, I think I was thinking about it. it. was It took all of the terms into account, but it's just the leading term. That That's sense. right, yeah. Other questions? Well, maybe if, while you're thinking, I'll... I'll reflect a little bit on, let's have a look at these two expressions. So the first, that is the, the S, the K linear combination of the S polynomials, every sum and there has multi-degree less than delta. There are cancellations, right? The the cancellation happens if you look here, right? The leading term here and the leading term here, they're both x to the delta and they cancel. So uh, somehow there is a cancellation of leading terms in this first sum, but it happens inside the s polynomials. There's no cancellations between different s polynomials. Well, there, there may be cancellations sort of below leading order that we don't care about, I guess. Uh, but the reason why that sum has multi-degree less than delta is something isolated within each S polynomial and the cancellation that happens there. Whereas in this final sum, the cancellation appears only after you add all the PIs together. And maybe it's not even there if you add only S minus one of them. Maybe you need all S of them to see the cancellation for, for some complicated reason. So the cancellation here uh, is sort of global in the sense that it, it's a phenomena to do with all of the polynomials, whereas here it's sort of local in the sense that it's to do with just the S polynomials internally. Uh, that's kind of, kind of the deep point. Uh, Okay, so let's move on to the next board and do uh, Buchberger's algorithm. Oh, sorry, uh, Buchberger's criterion. I be a polynomial ideal, by which we mean just a, an ideal in the polynomial ring. T 
take a generating set G. It's a Grobner basis. If and only if. For all pairs of generators, if I compute the S polynomial, that's easy, right? It's just an explicit formula. I look at the GI and GJ, I find the leading term, I just write this down, that's easy. If I then divide by G, I get zero. Okay, so this means remainder on division of the S polynomial by the sequence by G <coughs> in any order you like. Okay, pick an order, do the divisions with respect to that order. Uh, you'll get all zeros if and only if that's a Grobner basis. If the point about the order seems a bit fishy to you, uh, just see what happens in the proof and you'll, you'll see it's okay. I hope the statement is clear. Um, and I hope it's clear that this is something you could actually do, right? If I give you, well, it's not clear how you would find one still, right? But if I handed you an explicit list of polynomials, well, maybe it's a bit of a chore because you've got t squared minus t pairs to check. Uh, I guess T choose two. Um, you've got many pairs to check, but for each pair, you just have to do a division and then see if it's zero or not. Okay. All right. In one direction, well, uh, so that is, suppose it is a Grobner basis. This is a linear combination of GIs and GJs, right? So it's clearly in I. So from what I said earlier, if you have an element in I and you have a Grobner basis, then the division by that Grobner basis must be zero. By what we said earlier. So that direction is, is done. The reverse direction is the interesting one. So what are we trying to prove? We're trying to prove that if all these S polynomials have zero remainder upon division by G, then G is a Grobner basis. So let F in I be non-zero. We have to show the leading term of F is in the ideal generated by the leading terms of the G I's. That's what it means for it to be a Grobner basis, right? Okay, that is we need to show that the leading term is divisible by one of the leading terms of the GIs. Well, uh, where to begin? At least we know there's some expression of f as a linear combination of the g's, right? Because f is in i. What we're going to do is to consider a minimal such representation. So just a note, an item of terminology. I'm going to say a representation of f is going to mean a vector of polynomials, uh, t. a way of writing f such that of course there's many such ways of writing f as a linear combination of the g's there's at least one because f is in i and the trick is to consider as i said a minimal such representation what do i mean by minimal Okay. Look at any such expression. 
the multi-degree of f, that is the, the monomial that appears in the leading term of f, that's on the left-hand side of star, must also be the multi-degree of the right-hand side. Uh, what monomials appear on the right-hand side? Well, those that appear in HIGI, but maybe not all of them, because maybe there are cancellations, right? The leading term of that sum may not be uh, the leading term of any of the products, HIGI. We discussed that way back in lecture one or two. So this is less than or equal to, maybe strictly less than, what I'm going to call delta H. And delta H is the, the maximal multi-degree with respect to the order, of course, of the HIGIs. Uh, I guess this, this maximum is, is over those that are non-zero, right? Otherwise, there is no such thing as the multi-degree. Okay, so now let's, we have f fixed, and we have many representations of f. To get a bit of a grip on what's going on here, can you tell me even vaguely, like, if I have a representation whose delta h is large, what does that kind of mean versus it being small? What's one way of sort of saying informally what a large delta h means? Well, it's a long vector, but that's not very helpful. Mm. Sorry, could you give an example where it's not equal to delta H? Sure. Yep. So because there could be cancellations, like that's right. some larger multi-degree might disappear. That's right. Yeah. So if there's a large delta H, do you think it means there's more or less cancellations on the right-hand side? More. More, right. The larger delta H is, the bigger the gap between the sort of leading terms of these I mean, not just, I'm circling kind of the GI part, but it just kind of happens that in my example, the HI is a very low degree, so to speak. Um, these, these parts in the boxes, if they have very large multi-degree relative to the multi-degree of F, that means there must have been many cancellations in order to produce F from those things in the boxes, which had many larger monomials than the ones that appear in F. Okay, so you should think of large delta H as meaning many cancellations. So some representations of F have more cancellations than others. And what I'm going to do is consider the representation with the least possible cancellations. So consider the set of all the delta H's for H a representation of F. Well, that's a set of monomials. And by hypothesis, uh, our monomial order is well-founded, right? Which means this set has a minimal element. Uh, not well-foundedness, well-ordering, I guess, right? There's a minimal element, I'm going to call it delta. Delta is one of the delta H's. 
Delta H may be equal to delta H prime for two different representations, H and H prime, but I don't care. It doesn't matter. Uh, but since it, it occurs as one of the delta H's, we have from the above that the multi-degree of F is less than or equal to that delta. It may be equal. So if the multi-degree of F is actually equal to this minimal one, uh, then everything is easy because that means the multi-degree of F must be equal to the multi-degree of one of these summands. Right, because uh, by definition, uh, I guess this is, take a representation with, which realizes this minimum, and then look at the definition of delta, it's the maximal multi-degree of any of the HIGIs. Multi-degree of F is less than or equal to all of those. Uh, and the fact that it's equal to delta means it must be equal to at least one of them, right? the one that achieves that maximum. Uh, well, so what? OK, let's think about the relationship between F and HIGI that is implied by this equality of multi-degrees. The multi-degrees being equal means that, okay, so if that was alpha, then x to the alpha is the leading term of f. And if this is, uh, and that would also be the leading term of this, right? So if you think about it, what that means is that the leading term of gi has to divide the leading term of f, right? Because the leading term of that product will be the leading term of this times the leading term of that uh, is equal to the leading term of f. So um, we get this division as claimed, or as required, maybe is better. The whole point here was to show that if I took an arbitrary element of i, that its leading term was divisible by the leading term of one of the GIs. So if the multi-degree of F is equal to this minimal guy, then I'm done. Otherwise, we're going to go hunting for a contradiction, okay? Which will show the other case is impossible, and therefore we were already done. Reminds me of when you get someone a theorem proven, and you go, this is impossible. Now I have to figure out why it's impossible. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Ferreting around until you find the contradiction. Yeah, let's do some ferreting. I like that. OK, so suppose for a contradiction that the multi-degree is less. OK, and take one of these minimal representations. <clears throat> well, let's look at this representation a bit more closely. Okay, so let's split it up. I mean, somehow, m m some of the terms don't really matter much, right? So the, the i's for which that multi-degree is less than delta don't, don't really matter. So let's take the multi-degree of HIGI is equal to delta, those terms, and then there's other terms. <clears throat> and I'm going to split those other terms up further. going to call this this first term f. <coughs> oh, sorry. Uh, I'm going to split this first term up. Might be 
you see what I did there. Uh, I turned this term into these two terms by just writing hi as hi minus the leading term plus the leading term. Why? I'll explain in a sec. What's the point of doing that? Well, look at this guy here. All the terms have multi-degree less than delta. I'm just kind of saying that only the products HIGI, which achieve this minimal multi-degree, uh, are going to matter. And among those, we don't really care about the terms of HI that aren't leading either, because that was what kind of came out of that division observation we just made, right? It was really about the leading term of HI. Okay, so all the terms in that second and third sum n, 2 and 3, have multi-degree less than delta, because I made the degree of the leading term of HI smaller. And all terms here, uh, well, so that first thing we're just going to call f. <clears throat> now since the multi-degree of little f is less than delta, we have the multi-degree of f is less than delta. Why? Well, because this f is equal to this f minus all this stuff. If this f has multi-degree less than delta, and this all has, these are all terms of multi-degree less than delta, then capital F is equal to little f minus 2 and 3, uh, which must have multi-degree less than delta as well. Uh, okay. Now I'm going to introduce PIs. These are meant to remind you of the previous lemma. This is a definition. PI is going to mean the leading term of HI times GI. These satisfy the hypotheses of the lemma. Why? Well, what are the hypotheses of the lemma? The hypotheses of the lemma say that they, the thing adds up, the, the, the PIs add up to something with multi-degree less than delta. Right? I need a fixed delta such that uh, all the terms involved have multi-degree equal to delta, which they do. Right? That's, that's the the reason I'm picking out those terms. So each PI has multi-degree equal to delta, but their sum has multi-degree less than delta. There's some cancellations there. Okay, so that's the hypotheses of the lemma. So since the hypotheses apply, the conclusion is true, and the conclusion says F is a k-linear combination of the S polynomials. Okay. Uh, I didn't promise this would not be hardcore. Right? This is this is genuinely a, a piece of math we're doing right now. <clears throat> okay. Uh, it's probably not meant to be clear strategically what's happening, but uh, are there any technical points I can clarify for anybody? Yep, yeah, sorry, one point. Could you go over again, um, just verifying how PI all have the same degree? Sure. Or satisfying the lemma hypothesis? Yep. Okay, so that, that comes down to arguing that the multi degree of the leading term of HI times GI is equal to the multi-degree of HI GI. Oh, ah. I, yeah, I think this, I think I'm also just presenting it badly. 
there's somehow there's no there's no real indices on these sums, right? But when I when I talk about these pi's, I mean just those i's which contribute to this first sum. Uh, yeah. So I take okay. only the i's for which the multi-degree of h i g i is equal to delta, and then it's just the observation that the multi-degree of the leading term of h i times g i is equal to the multi-degree of h i g i. Yeah. Okay. No, that makes sense. Thanks. Cool. Any other points I can clarify? All right. Then let's proceed. <clears throat> okay. But. Uh, as we just discussed, the multi-degree of pi is equal to delta, so this calculation works as follows. What's the leading term of pi? Well, as we just kind of discussed, that's the leading term of hi times the leading term of gi, and then pi is by definition this. Delta here is the least common multiple of x to the delta and x to the delta. Right? This is as it was in the proof. This is a point that Billy asked about. Okay, so that's just expanding the definitions, and we get some cancellations. Oops. Okay. <clears throat> now this almost looks like the S polynomial of uh, GI and GJ. Right, now we see the hypothesis emerging that the division upon G by the S polynomials is zero. We haven't used that anywhere, right? So it's got to appear. And we see here well, we don't quite know how this, I'm not, so I, yeah, I should have said this earlier. So we found from the lemma that f is a k-linear combination of the s polynomials. I haven't used that yet. I'm just going to examine what the s polynomials are to see what that means. So I'm just computing the s polynomials right now, and I see it's got something to do with the s polynomials of the gi and gjs, which is good because I know something about those. Okay, so what is the exact relationship? Well, it, it would be the S polynomial if these numerators were something else, right? If I took gamma ij to be the least common multiple of, um, of the leading monomial of gi and the leading monomial of gj, the S polynomial uh, of gi, gj is by definition x to the gamma ij on the leading term of gi, gi, x to the gamma ij, on the leading term of gj, gj. Well, so this is just x to the delta minus gamma ij times that. You multiply that in there, you'll get this expression here. I just have to convince you, I guess, that that division actually makes sense, that gamma ij is always in every degree less than or equal to delta. Um, but that's, uh, that's true because the deltas, uh, how should I say this? So gamma ij delta, I mean that difference is non-negative because delta is the multi-degree of something times gj, of gi, say. Right, so of course delta is larger in every degree than every gi, and therefore uh, than their least common multiple. Okay, so that's non-negative. Um, 
Good. So the S polynomials are this monomial times the S polynomial of the GIs. Okay, what does that mean? It means that F is a K linear uh, yeah, K linear combination of the S P I P J's, but therefore also of the X to the delta gamma I J's S G I G J's. Okay, we're about to run through the boards and lose this context, unfortunately. So um, are there any questions about this before we, we do that? We're nearly there. There's just a few more lines and we're done. Sorry, what was the reason that this was positive? It was non-negative, rather. Okay, so uh, you happy with this? Yeah. Okay, so that means that in every degree, delta is larger than... Uh, um, how should I say this? So let, let the leading monomial of GI be x to the alpha i. So from this, we deduce that delta is, I need a notation for larger in every degree. Forgive me, but I'll just write <laughs> this for the next two seconds, yeah. Okay, so delta is larger in every degree than alpha i but it's also larger in every degree than alpha j, and therefore it's larger in every degree than the least common multiple, uh, which is literally just take the largest of those two in each degree. Right, yeah, yeah, okay. Sounds good, yep. Cool. Other questions? Okay, maybe to sum up so far, we're trying to prove that uh, if f has a multi-degree less than delta, we're trying to reach a contradiction. What we've done is we've written f uh, in terms of capital F, which was just those i's for which the multi-degree of higi was delta, and some other stuff, which we don't care about. Now we're examining f. And we've used the lemma to rewrite f as a k-linear combination of these s polynomials with the pi's, and now as a k-linear combination of the s polynomials of the gi's with this prefactor. Okay, so let's continue. Now we use the hypothesis. Since S, G, I, G, J, division by G is zero, the division algorithm will give us an expression of this form. That's what I mean by I don't care what order you do the division. I just need this expression, right? So I could have, could have actually stated that in the hypothesis. I could have said instead uh, the S polynomial can be written in this way with the following condition, which follows from the division algorithm. So I, it's not any expression. I need that the multi-degree of each, uh, if AL, GL is non-zero, the multi-degree of that is less than or equal to the multi-degree of the S polynomial. When you do division, that's for free. Then x to the delta minus gamma ij s g i g j is just multiplying both sides of this by x to the delta minus gamma ij. Gives me this expression where BL is x to the delta minus gamma ij times AL. And the previous multi degree condition became the following multi degree condition. Whenever this is non zero, 
which is the same as AL GL being non-zero, we have that the multi-degree of BL GL is less than or equal to the multi-degree of this. pause on this for a moment. So we have this relationship between the multi-degrees, uh, but the monomial order is additive. So if I add the same thing or multiply both of these by the same monomial, uh, I'll still have that relationship between the multi-degrees. But that's what I did here, right? To get from there to there, I just multiply by this monomial. And to get from there to there, I also multiply by that monomial. So this inequality follows from this one. But we know what the multi-degree, or we know a bound on the multi-degree of this thing here. That's less than delta. Since the leading term of the leading term of G I of the S polynomial is less than the least common multiple. Uh, maybe I didn't quite explain why that is. Um, so, yeah, maybe maybe let's let's dwell on that for a second. If I compute the S polynomial, it's going to be, by definition, this divided by the leading term, GI minus this leading term of GJ. Well, again, somehow the leading term here will cancel with that. So this first polynomial will look like X to the delta IJ plus lower order stuff. I don't know why that's suddenly in green, but <laughs> let's go with it. Uh, And same there, and those are going to cancel. So the leading term of the S polynomial will come from this lower order stuff, and hence this. Does that make sense? Yeah, that was clear to me. Okay. Okie doke. Hence. Since F is a K linear combination of the X to the delta minus gamma IJ SGI GJs for various I and J. But each of those we can in turn write like this. Right now, that's from this hypothesis. Right, that's what hap What happened on this board was we applied this hypothesis. So all of those s polynomials, when you multiply them with that prefactor, can be written as linear combinations of the GLs. So taking that k linear combination of that linear combination of the GLs, so plugging that line with a red arrow on it into whatever k-linear combination that you're using to express f, you obtain an expression like the following for some b tilde l's. You have f is equal to b tilde l gl. Now here's a little bit of a tricky point we'll have to discuss. Um, if that expression is non-zero, then its multi-degree is less than delta. Okay, I'll just pause for a moment, let you catch your breath, and then I'll explain where that comes from. So we've got our k-linear combination. So uh, 
maybe I'll just call them like some lambda times some x to the delta minus gamma i j s g i g j and this is this k-linear combination I'm not going to put indices on things because it's there's already, already too many indices but hopefully you get the idea so this is something in k and then I've got one of these guys and there's many other i's and j's and terms like that off over here I'm not really expressing this as a leading term in any sense it's just one of those sums and then what I do is I take this guy and I write it out as a sum over L of BLGL. And then I've got similar expressions here for different polynomials BL and different I's and J's. And then I've taken that inside and making that, I've made that a, um, a lambda BLGL plus more terms. And then I've collected I mean, these expressions out here have g1 through gt in them as well, and I collect terms. And that's what gives me this expression, right? This is kind of my b tilde 1. Okay, suppose one of these coefficients is non-zero. Let's suppose for the sake of simplicity it's, it's this one here, right? Suppose this is non-zero. Then one of the things in here has to be non-zero. What's the kind of thing that goes in there? Well, it's something like a lambda b1, right? It comes from one of these expressions. I'm obviously explaining this a bit informally, but it would kind of be uh, actually even worse to try and understand if I tried to put indices on everything. So just bear with me. I hope this works. Okay, so the kind of thing that goes inside this bracket is a coefficient of g1 in one of these expressions. But they're all of the form some scalar times b1 for b1 being one of these coefficients that's appearing. And if this expression is non-zero, which is our hypothesis, then one of these has to be non-zero. But that means that one of the b1s is non-zero. Well, sorry, it means that one of the B1G1s is non-zero. But if we go back to the last board, as soon as one of those is non-zero, we have that the multi-degree of BLGL is less than delta. So that means, so if we look in here, we'll have the multi-degree of B1G1, say, is less than delta. But that's true for all the sum ends that appear here, as soon as they're non-zero. Right? So from that, we deduce that the multi-degree of B tilde LGL must be less than delta. Yeah, so that's not, not meant to be a, a really substantial point. It's just something that maybe you need to check a little bit. OK, so now we're done. Why? Well, uh, now it would be really handy to copy and paste from the earlier board. Uh, I'll reproduce it. Um, so remember the we had this big linear combination of stuff that made a new expression of f, and it looked like this. And that was that was pi, right? Um, plus these lower order terms that didn't matter because all terms here have multi degree less than delta, right? And this was this was f, capital F that we've been analyzing. What have we just shown in, in star here on the previous board? We've written capital F as a sum of terms of products, but in particular if we expand out that sum, every term on the right-hand side has 
degree less than delta. Right? Every monomial that appears is less than delta in the monomial order. Okay, so we've actually shown all terms so by star all terms in F also have multi-degree less than delta hence double star is a representation Right? I mean, it's stuff times GIs, and that's the same over here. So if you collect terms, you'll have a representation, an expression of F as a linear combination of GIs. H is a bad word, a bad letter for it. Well, let's call it H prime. So if you look at that expression in double star and extract from it a representation of F, you'll have a delta H prime, which is less than delta, uh, because all the terms in F have multi-degree less than delta. And this contradicts minimality. of delta. So we're done. That contradiction shows that in fact the multi-degree of f had to be equal to delta in the beginning uh, and therefore um, the conclusion. Right? So we deduce from that that uh, that the we did assumed that the S polynomials had zero remainder, and we've now deduced that they're a Grobner basis. Okay, so that's it. Uh, by far the most substantial theorem we've proven so far, and probably the hardest part of the course. Any questions? Uh, that was all people I knew. <laughs> yeah, sweet dreams of Grobner bases. But again, which gives me the glorious opportunity to say, Dan, there's another typo on the black on the boards, but it took a while to emerge. Oh yeah. Um, you started something already. <laughs> oh no. And then you never used it. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's that's the thing I wanted to refer to. That's what I now call double star. Oh dear. It's fine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I did. It did when I when I wrote the star. I, I had a bit of a twinge that I'd already written it. Uh. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I mean, this this very much feels like a ferreting out of contradiction proof. But I don't know. It's not too ridiculous. It's just kind of like I, somehow you could see in hindsight how where we were going with this was we were going to produce something that should have lower degree. This is not completely shocking in hindsight, at least, so that's something. Yeah, it's uh, it's kind of remarkable when you consider that uh, you have to you have to have invented the idea of S polynomials and this proof simultaneously somehow, right? So yeah, I mean, were S polynomials invented for something different? Or? No, no, they were invented at the same time as this argument. So this okay, that is pretty ridiculous. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, there's a reason. If it was a case of it like being used to something else first, then this would be more plausible. But okay, this is a bit silly. Mm. But hey, it works. Yeah, this is cool. I like this proof. Uh, any other questions? Nice. Okay, see you on Okay, I should um I should go too. So uh thanks everyone. Yep.